Good morning, everybody. Oh, let me shut my fan. Okay, now it's my Friday morning prayer time. But I didn't even I'm in the bathtub and get ready to pray. And I'm like, oh, I gotta make videos. <laughs> so I'm, I didn't shave or nothing. But I, I'm gonna have to talk about things. I got, that's the only way I'm gonna uh, we deal with these things. Uh, I want to talk about on the news uh, yesterday. Uh, it, it's beneficial for many of you uh, for me to share some of the experience uh, my many years working with police and all. And there are times where things in the city here are done at the local level. And when they do them, I'm like, oh, these guys are lying. Or they're making policy changes, but they're the public is absolutely unaware of why these guys are doing this stuff. A few years ago, the Corpus Christi uh, Police Department stopped responding to car wrecks. Now, I know why they did that. Okay, they don't want to do reports, and it, at the fire department we had fire reports, and we also had incident reports. And none of the firemen, uh, you took turns. I, I was, I made a driver. I promoted very early on. I was the earliest promotion, the youngest driver, which is that there were three ranks in the beginning: firefighter, uh, engineer driver. We all did firefighting. We were a small department and then captain. Eventually we had a lieutenant, but I promoted early on because I didn't want to be on the ambulance. That wasn't my thing. I wanted to be firefighting. And as a driver, yes, you also fought fires, but you hooked up the truck at the hydrant. But the other thing you wanted to get off, not to be on, was reports. So everyone had to take turn doing reports. So you got up at night whenever there was an ambulance call or a fire on, and if uh, you're not on the truck or on the ambulance, one guy had to stay behind and do reports, and he didn't like that. Most of the guys wanted to be on the run. So we hated that. And eventually they added more, like, oh, you know, you're going to have to do more reports. Well, police also have to go to accident scenes. It's required by law. If there's an accident, you have to have an officer on the scene. Why? I've known this for years. Because you cannot, when the, when the insurance uh, is going to pay for whoever is liable for the accident, you have to have a police report to say a determination on who was uh, responsible for the accident. And a few years ago, the Corpus Christi Police Department came out with a policy and it said, we're not going to go to accidents. And I saw this on the news and I thought, this is such a, such a scam on the public of this city. And the reason they said they were not going to go to accidents, respond to car wrecks, minor ones. We had, at the firehouse, we called them 1050 major, 1050 minor. That was the... I don't know what Nueces County would use. That was Clayburg County, Kingsville. So if we went to Iraq, we said we have a 1050 uh, major, 1050 minor. So we have the major car wreck or a minor car wreck. But regardless of whatever one, we had to have an officer on the scene for that particular purpose. Also, if there were injuries, um, the ambulance would be there. So when the city of Corpus Christi Police Department said, we got a policy change, we're not going to go anymore. I immediately knew they were lying. They said they didn't want to go because they didn't want to tie up. They didn't want to tie up officers at, uh, at Rex because they needed to respond to other things. That's not why they did that. They lied. They did it because of what I explained. If you, if all of us wanted to get out of doing reports, and that's exactly why. Well, when I saw them make that policy a few years ago on the news, I thought, that, I don't know, there's no city in the United States of America that the police department does not respond to car wrecks. 
None, as far as I know. But they did it. They weren't going. Well, then what you had is people that had insurance, that had uh, wrecks and all minor wrecks. There was no police reports. And the insurance was not paying. And the people that somebody hit your vehicle and they were at fault, and even if they admitted they were at fault, and they said, oh, I went through the light and I hit the other car, the insurance claims cannot get paid. And the insurance companies would be saying, uh, we need the police report. Corpus Christi, Texas doesn't make them. They what? We're, we're an insurance, we're all stay or whatever. So then, about a week ago, two weeks ago, I knew they were lying again. Uh, but the uh, Chief Merkel, the police chief that they promoted, who's from here, he came on the news and said, well, the policy of us not responding to car wrecks like all police departments in the world do, in the universe. If there's life on other planets, yes, they respond. But Corpus Christi is the only one that doesn't. But the chief said, we're going to change that policy. Because we instituted it to free up our officers. No, no, you instituted it because, what I explained, you didn't want to do reports. You didn't want the paperwork. But he said, but it didn't help us. We looked at the response times, uh, you know, whether or not it was helping, and it didn't help. No, no, what happened was, what I explained, uh, insurance companies were saying, what's going on in Corpus Christi, Texas? We have wrecks on uninsured people. Uh, other vehicles actually were at fault, and we can't get claims to be paid out by their liability because your city's the only one in the world that doesn't have police reports. That's why they changed. And you're just seeing little degree. Now, I was at Pop's house last week when he was not doing too well that day, but that was the same day uh, uh, Jimmy D... Uh, just got out of Charlie's for a doctor's appointment. He used to live right in that area. Sure enough, I saw Jimmy that day. And uh, I've worked with that kid, Stephen. I mentioned now, Pops. There was a new provider. He has various people that come in and work. And there was a new girl there I've not seen before. I'm not going to say her name, but I remember it because when she told me her name, it's a biblical name. So I said, oh, you know, that's in the Bible. But... Uh, I thought it was one of his other providers at first that Pop used to tell me about, but no, it was somebody else. He has two or three people that come by. So as I talked to her, I said, oh, man, Pops does not look good. I've not seen him laying down like this. And then that day he had fallen. They told me about that. But she wanted to talk, and I had the other kid there, Stephen, the homeless guy was helping. And uh, she said, yeah, she kind of realized I was doing ministry. So she said, well, you know, uh, uh, she has some kids, and she's pregnant, and she said, but uh, I leave my past behind, John, and um, even though I had a lot of things that, you know, people remind me of my past, maybe she was involved in some of the stuff that some of my friends are involved in. She says, but I'm moving on, and I said, that's right. I said, Did we forget the past. I quoted Paul, this one thing I do, forget those things which are behind, and reach forth into things that aren't fun. So... As we were talking, on her own, she doesn't know me, but I guess she has a past with boyfriends that are in jail, stuff like that, and, and she tells me, uh, she says, do you know the police in this town are, I, I, I didn't want to use the word, but the word is affiliated, and the reason I don't want to use it is, affiliated is a word they use when some of the kids are in gangs. But uh, my, some of my friends who want to get on the right track, that, that is a big thing on them. Like they say, oh, but I, I already have all these connections and I can't move on. And, uh, you know, sometimes they even tell me <laughs> that the friends that uh, they're with, the people they're involved with, they, they'll say, no, if you want to go and live for God, you know, that's okay. We'll let you go live for God. I've heard that before. So, a lot of these people, uh, but they get that tag. But this lady told me, this girl, first day I met her, she said, you know, like it was a surprise to me. She said, you know, there's a, a, a underground group of police officers 
that are involved in organized crime. And like, she was almost like, did you know? I said, no, no, I'm aware of that. That day, two officers actually came because they called on some of the homeless friend that stays at Pop's house. So they actually called the cops that day because some of the neighbors didn't want uh, Stephen staying there. And there was a, a female officer and a male officer that showed up. I'm sure, at least the female officer, she seemed very nice. And I just talked to her for a second because I was taking Jimmy and was going to drop him back off for Charlie's. They don't know. The younger officers don't know. It's the ones that have been around. And, and there's a degree of them. And to them, it's like they justify. But when you're dealing with, you had a killing take place. The, many, the, the officer I've dealt with and talked about in many, many cases, many, many years, but he killed somebody years ago in his cop car. Now, I knew this for a while because over the years the guys would complain. I forget the man's name. It was here in Flower Bluff and it was at the Paris Apartments, which are right over here. But I remember Matt and the guys used to bring this up a lot. Say so he when he killed him. I looked for that story, but they they scrub records. Do you understand? If a cop's involved, I, I give you the case, this the public's not aware of this. If a cop's involved, the one case I gave a while ago, an officer, off-duty officer was drunk, and he shot two people. He killed one. The other one didn't die. Now, obviously, he came out of a club, and he killed one, shot the other. The witnesses said this cop was drunk, came out shooting. That went before grand jury. Now, I believe this was Dallas. But the grand jury, by law, was not allowed to know that officer was drunk. Because the union, for that officer, they had it in their contract that if our officers, we investigate them, and they're drunk or they committed crimes, their contract says this cannot be revealed to the grand jury or to the uh, people that are sitting on the grand jury. That's amazing. That is utterly amazing that the in-house supervisors of a police department can actually do an internal investigation showing crime on one of their uh, officers. And by their own contract, if that goes to a grand jury, they withhold that evidence because it's in their contract. And that's what happened in that case. That officer, when it went before a grand jury, the witnesses in that case of the cop that killed that person shot two people while he was drunk, they did not know he was drunk. And his lawyer d defended the prosecutor, actually, that brings these cases before the grand jury, uh, presented it as he was not drunk. He certainly was not drunk, yet they knew he certainly was drunk. So if you have somebody that shoots an individual and says, I'm going to murder people, and actually goes out and murders those people, and he's an officer, that's going to be withheld that he actually made threats, first chance I get, I will kill you. And then he kills him. And you don't, that does not go before the grand jury because he's an officer. And that, that is what happened here. Now, I don't know if he threatened to kill the man he killed, which he did kill. Paris Apartments, Corpus Christi, Texas. But I do know that this officer had made multiple threats and also assaulted my friends over a period of years. I reported it. He told one of my friends, Albert Hoffman, I will make you disappear. If you do not leave this city, I will make you disappear. This officer also assaulted my friends while off duty, targeted them. And then with a history like that, of statements that, quote, I will make you disappear because I want you out of this area. I will get you. I will assault you over and over. I'll plan drugs. With all of that history, and then to have someone, you kill someone in the back of your cop car, and they rule that man's death, he was part of the group, the many homeless for many years, and they ruled his death, he died of asthma, I believe. And the, guy, and the witnesses said, no, he choked him to death in that cop car. Now, this was a real murder that took place. Not only was there absolutely no uh, 
nothing happened, but this officer later gets promoted and continues uh, daily breaking the law. And so you have the crimes of murder, assault and battery, over and over and over and over. History. Me running into Pop's new um, provider, saying, all the way on the other side of town, never met this girl before. <laughs> nice Mexican girl. But her boyfriend back there, she said, oh, do you know that they're affiliated, they're an organized crime day? <laughs> yes, yes, I know, I know. Everyone that wants to promote the city. <laughs> and I see the mayor and the commissioners, all they got, I gave them names, letters, everything. They couldn't care less. They're more concerned with, uh, we're going to reroute downtown Corpus Christi. I keep seeing letters in the newspaper about the rerouting. Corpus Christi used to have the most beautiful scenic drive anywhere in the country. My father from New Jersey used to love it. I used to go to work in Kingsville, and when I drove home, there's a couple of little country roads, FM 70, back roads. I used to go the long way, all the way down Highway 77 for the mayor. And also, you know, I'd come from Kingsville, off-duty as fireman, back to my house here in Corpus Christi and Flower Bluff. So I would go the long route, 44 all the way, or 77 all the way to either 44, they know the roads, the people that live here, or 37. Then I'd come down, and instead of taking... Uh, Crosstown Expressway or SPID, I would actually go Ocean Drive because there was a natural flow of the highway coming all the way down, and Ocean Drive was a beautiful road that your downtown Corpus Christi, most beautiful scenic route, I think, in the country. It's destroyed. They destroyed it. And you used to ride all the way down Ocean Drive and see the beautiful water in downtown. Well, they did million, million dollar, you know, improvements. They rerouted that, and, and it's, it almost looks like it's a permanent, you know, construction site that you can't drive it anymore. It takes you through an area very, it looks like they destroyed it. And I keep seeing letter after letter after letter in the Corpus Christi editorial of people that, from Michigan, the last one, said, I used to love coming to the city. What did you do? You destroyed and it costs money for them to destroy it. They invest it. it. It is terrible. I think anybody, anybody, I don't think anybody that, commissioners and all that were for that, I, I think they realized they made a drastic mistake because if they can ever possibly go back to the way it was, it was so beautiful. And that's I'm just commenting on that. But what I want you to understand is part of the city, I've been, I put up that, that study, that poll that was done that uh, said Nueces County, Corpus Christi, was the second most uh, corrupt city in the courts in Thompson Hall, in the, in, as all the counties in the United States, out of many thousands, were number two out of thousands. This plays a role. I knew that the department was out of control. Even that little thing about what I told you about the reports. I, they, I was taking pops one day. I told you this story. I don't make stories up. Uh, the prosecutors here and all, they're filled with deception. You've seen in courts them lying. You see uh, case after case after case where people, uh, kids that were in courts, stood up and said, no, no, they want me to frame this other guy. And if you just looked at that case, you knew that they, that kid was telling the truth. And so this is all deception, so lies that they're using or the Hannah Overton thing, which is now going to be a documentary. This affects your city. You, you treat it lightly. And you say, we need to build up the uh, problems that we had across the country with police and all. Yes, we do. We need to uh, repair community relations. Yes, we do. And the way you do it is you don't have absolute criminals on departments nonstop and letting them go. And you could go anywhere in the town and people will tell you the same thing. So you fix that. If you had firefighters setting arsons, murdering people, shooting people, killing people, and promoting them firefighters and they're burning left and right lynching people, and you say, well, it's given us fire department a bad reputation. You correct it, you remove that firefighter that's lynching people that's burning houses, that's, so if you have officers murdering, killing, 
regularly routine run and rogue assault and battery hundreds 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 on duty officer you finally one day deal with it and then you look when you say did he kill this guy or not everybody else says he killed him outright it smothered him in the cop car killed him the back seat and you rule that as asthma what about the history of him threatening to kill people meaning he said to them I'll make you disappear, Albert Hoffman. He told that to Albert Hoffman. I wrote you a letter. Did you investigate that? So I see the, the false view they try to give you by saying, look how wonderful the commissioners and all the mayor. And you, you turn a blind eye to murder, but murder's taking place in your city. This is, I was reading Judges, and it's interesting because sometimes I'll read a scripture or somebody will share a scripture, and then I'll read it again, or uh, it'll come up in two different chapters. For instance, I read a psalm, and I don't want to, uh, I, I'm trying to be careful when I, I put that psalm up, but in scripture, <laughs> it talks about judgment, when people... Kings are overweight or whatever. That talks about judgment. I even shared that story. I wrote the psalm uh, a couple of times just the other day. It's the one on those that are uh, in authority and kind of overweight. Okay? I want to be careful with that. But I, I gave that psalm. And then I read the story in Judges. I'm in the book of Judges as well as in the New Testament. 21 minutes. And this is the famous story. I've not read it in a long time, but I read it the same day or two that I read the other one about judgment. But God, in Judges, God raises up deliverers. Okay? And you read the great stories of the great leaders bringing victory. I want to read a few verses. And then, I just, I'm not sure if I gave you every example. But when I see these things... Oh, the, let me tell you that car wreck. I forgot. Pops, I was taking Pops from his house when he lived on Waco Street, which is right by City Hall. And he had some of those doctor's appointments, cancer appointments. And we were going down Staples Street, which is also destroyed now because of all the ongoing construction. But right about Staples and Morgan uh, Cross Street, uh, a lady got rear-ended by a kid in a pickup truck. And I heard it. I mean, it was right next to us. We just passed the lady up. I knew she was a lady because I got out and tried to help, and I did help her. But when she got hit, I heard it. Now, this is one of those wrecks that the cops don't go to. They've changed it, but at this time, this is one of them. Well, they hit her. Maybe doing 20. That's a pretty good hit. And I just looked in my rearview mirror. Just looked. And I saw there was some damage to the back of her vehicle, black vehicle. So I told Pops, I said, oh, you know, Pops, and I've done a lot of this my whole life. I said, I better get out and check on her, just in case. He said, okay, John. So I stopped. And, of course, her vehicle was right in the middle of the street there, right about Morgan and Staples. And uh, she, the kid in the pickup took off. It was a hit and run. He might have had drugs on him or something. It's kind of rough area. But he put, backed up and took off real quick. I didn't get his license. But I went up to the girl in the car. She might have been a little scared. You know, I got the long hair and all. And I said, and of course it's a bad area. But she worked at, at one of the clinic hospitals right there. One of them I actually used to take pops to. And it was right on the corner. But she was shaking. It looked like she had whiplash because I could just see. And she had thrown up. That's a sign of a head injury, by the way, if somebody, possible head injury if they threw up. So uh, she needed help. I said no, and she was on the phone trying to call 911 and also her work and just shook, shooken up real bad. I said, oh, okay, okay. I said, we got to get out of the car, and then we got to go sit over here. And then she trusted me after a few seconds. I said, okay, we got to get out. It's in the middle of the road. Now, that's that's dangerous. That's what you need cops. They were not going to these minor car wrecks. So I uh, took her over to a bus bench right there. And uh, she was on 911 
and maybe the 911, look, I used to call the dispatch ladies that were our dispatch, and uh, maybe, they, do you need a ambulance or you and I got on the phone, I said, look, she was in a, a car wreck, she looks like she's hurt, yes, she needs an ambulance, send an ambulance, so I did scene control, which was nice, and made sure nobody hit the car, and then finally, the cops did not come, the fire department, there's a fire station, down the street. So when they got there, they kind of saw that, because they said, no, this is what happened, this is where she is. I got over here, like I was doing scene control. So they kind of like, oh, they didn't ask if I was fireman or nothing, or retired. So, But that's why you needed cops. And the cops did not go there. And I just thought, it's an amazing thing. I think the public is unaware what they're pulling off, what they're pulling over you guys. You're absolutely unaware that they got away with that for as long as they did. That is a young. So, Ehud. Let's do a little of Judges. An angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bokhal and said, I made you go up out of Egypt and have brought you into the land which I swore unto your fathers. You shall make no league with the inhabitants of the land. So God's bringing the people in and he's telling them, uh, uh, this is the promised land. And he says, you're not going to become part. You're not going to mix. Paul says in Corinthians, be not, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. It's a matter of some. So he's saying, basically, stay separated. Don't join with them. That was the fall of King Solomon. Now, these are the nations to which the Lord left to prove Israel. Those that had not known the wars of Canaan. Only that the generations of children of Israel might know uh, to teach them war. This is Judges 3, 1 and 2. God, and there were some nations that were left. And they were left for a purpose. Uh, they, they were still in the land. The promised land was not completely cleared out. And it was so the children, the younger generation, who did not know the earlier wars of their fathers, that they too would learn to fight. It was training. Training for reigning. I like that. Now, God starts raising up judges or deliverers. And the Spirit of the Lord, this, this is Othniel, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel and went out to war. And the Lord delivered them. Leadership. And I like this. And he gathered the children of Ammon, Amalek and went and smote Israel and possessed the city of palm trees. I got palms all out there. So God's raising up leadership. But I like this story. I want you to see this goes with the verse about the fat man. When the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. I always think of the leader of Turkey when I read this story. The present leader. Uh, and Ehud made a dagger. Now, this is a deliverer. This is one of God's leadership. Ehud made a dagger which had two edges of a cubit length, and he girded under his raiment upon his right thigh. So he's got this knife. I, I got a dagger up there. Puts it on his right thigh, and he brought the present unto Eglon, king of Moab. And Eglon was a very fat man. And when he made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present, but he himself turned again from the quarries that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, Keep silence. So now he's talking to this king, this very fat king. He says, I got a secret errand God has sent me to the fat man. Oh, really? The king says, fat man says. So he puts everybody out. He says, Okay. He thinks he's going to get a special present. <laughs> And he put everybody out. Go, everybody go out, the king says. And Ehud, who is God's man, came unto him as he was sitting in a summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. So he's relaxing, this king, wicked king, fat, living high on the hog. Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he rose out of his seat, and he had put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. There's the message yet. And the, sh the haft, the whole sword, 
dagger went in after the blade, and the fat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly, and the dirt came out. Then Ehud went forth and shut the door, and then he leads a victory, he blows a trumpet and leads a victory. Now, it was interesting because I had just put, I just read that song, Dealing Again. I, I posted, I'll probably post it here. I like it because it's, it's God's deliverance. Let me see if I got that verse up here somewhere. I know I posted it somewhere. The Psalm on the Fat Man. At the dagger. This is not now to us today. We don't, the, the dagger to us is the word of the Lord. So we had a two-edged one. And I remember that story, and it was significant because I haven't read it in a long time in my normal reading. And I read it like the same day. What is that significant of? It, the, the sword is the word of God, the dagger. It's significant because Scripture says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word will be established. So it's, it's speaking that a lot of the corruption that we've also seen in this region, God's going to deal with. That's what it's significant about. It's significant because a lot of uh, a lot of the people that live in this city and all the little examples I gave you to me when I see them making those excuses why they didn't go. We had incidents where cops uh, somebody was going to break in on the island, which is an expensive home on Padre Island, right that way. And the lady was calling the cops, somebody's at the door, going to murder them or whatever. She's calling, nobody showed. I think it was over an hour. Now I knew there was problems. And at the time, Chief Simpson was alive, Floyd Simpson. I pray for his wife and kids still. So I got his name up in the picture. But I thought, I, there's no city where, unless there's major, major, you know, uh, emergency going on, like big, bombing or something. But there's no city where you're calling and somebody's breaking in, going to kill you or shoot you, and an officer does not show up. It just does not happen in that regular city. Because you have, you call in off duty, you get standby. So I remember, and, and that, that family, they were military, but they said people in this city need to know that there's a huge, huge problem. So, I see that. I see that. You've heard all the stories, and, 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 it's, and they don't deal with those issues. You've got cases of possible murders taking place, or even off-duty. All that, a, a, a level of criminality that ranks this city as number two. This county, number two in the entire United States of America for corruption and filtration. And you want to promote it. I understand that. You must deal with that. You cannot have, if these guys are going on duty, and as soon as they're on duty, it's crimes. And I can go to talk to a provider for POPs that I've never met in my life. After a few minutes, she, uh, because of, I guess, her past with various boyfriends, she told me she had a past on her own. She says, oh, did you know that uh, the cops in the city are connected with organized crime, underground crime, hits, killings, murder. Well, I happen to know that. Now, how could I accidentally run into somebody that's never met me before? And she's aware. All the way So do you think it's a problem? You investigate the killing of that kid at the Paris apartments. You had an officer threatening to make Albert off of this. Killing, assault, and battery, telling him he's going to kill people. And then he kills him. And you reinvestigate him. Can't get away with murder. It wasn't an asthma attack. <laughs> I like that. We're gonna end. I don't know what I'll title this. <laughs> so Ehud, Ehud told the fat king, I have a message from God unto thee. And he arose out of his seat. <laughs> Arise, O God. And judge, and judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. When thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. When you see all of these things, then know that the kingdom is here. 
as lightning goes from one end to, of heaven to another, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be in his day. But first he suffers many things. He will cause us to ride upon the high places of the earth. Bless the Lord, O ye servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord. Okay, that's the message for today. The words of the wise are like goax, and the house fastened by the masters of assemblies, given by one shepherd. I have finished the work that you gave me to do.